OK, so we are recording um, and just to introduce for the people watching the recording instead of live um, today, we are hearing from a team at the University of North Georgia's Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. We have Tasha Cochran, Cochran Greta Giles, Clark, Ma Clark Miller and Bell, Bill Ellen. I'm sorry, I'm butchering names today. Bill Ellen Berger. Um, and we are going to hear about their chemistry case studies. Uh, so please take it away. OK, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tasha Karan, and I was the principal investigator on um, two of these ALG grants. Um, and before we get started, I just want to say thank you to the ALG program for giving us the opportunity to and funding these projects um, to our department and uh, UNG in general for the, the support they've given us. So we are um, going to talk about sort of our project of using case studies in our chemistry courses. And I'll just kind of run through the, the slides as we go. So why did we choose case studies? <sighs> Students tell us that for science courses, especially chemistry, they have a hard time connecting content to the real world. Um, and then education folks are telling us that this failure to connect the reason that we're giving them this content uh, doesn't excite students to stay in the sciences. Um, and the latest information I found said that um, out of 1.8 million bachelor's degrees, only 18% were in STEM fields. And that's concerning. Um, if you think about the time that we're living in right now with the, the COVID-19 virus, we need science people. Uh, we need problem solvers. We need people who can think outside the box and, and look at these real world applications to what as teachers, we're trying to teach these students. And so case studies seemed like a good way to kind of begin that narrative to kind of move students into a, maybe a new way of thinking about some things. So case studies are pretty, um, pretty simple, really, in nature. They're stories uh, with a learning objective. So usually they include content that a, a professor would like to present to their students. And then they include a narrative, a story behind it. Um, it can either be um, a, a fictional story, a real world application, um, latest news uh, information. And this narrative is supposed to kind of pull students in to get them excited about the content that we're discussing. Um, and the other part of the case study is that we want students to use skills at higher levels. We don't want them to just memorize facts and regurgitate them back to us on a test. We want them to have a deeper level of thinking. And as science majors, we really need for these students to be able to accomplish that, not just memorize some facts and, and be done. We need for them to begin analyzing things and putting pieces of puzzles together. So this was sort of our goal. We wanted to engage students, get them excited about some of the topics we were um, presenting to them in the classes, but we also wanted to implement some deeper thinking. So this is Bloom's Taxonomy, uh, which is a common educational tool uh, used for creating learning objectives and things in courses. And for science, we really that analyze the third one down is, is one that we focus in on quite a bit because we do give them data. Uh, we want them to be able to analyze that data uh, to make conclusions about the data, uh, good or bad, um, and then you know question some of that. So in this kind of bloom taxonomy ideal, we, we want them doing deeper thinking, not just memorizing and repeating. Uh, we want them to analyze and evaluate and um, and create. So now even with the, the folks making the, the viruses. Um, you know, like the, the COVID-19. Um, things at the moment, you know, we those folks needed to be creative to maybe think outside the box and and do something that had not been done before. And that's what we need our science students to to be able to accomplish after they leave us. So case studies, I, I think I'm, I'm biased, of course, but they they can explore historical or hypothetical scenarios. Um, and we sort of chose 
ones that we wanted or thought that students would encounter later in their careers as scientists. Um, other areas of discipline have been using case studies for a long time. If you think about law schools, um, that's a lot of the basis of how students learn there. They're given a case, they do the research, they dig a little deeper into the content given um, in order to kind of come up with a solution to the problem. So the, the students can apply something uh, in a real world situation. And I think the, the nice thing, at least the last semester and a half, was the flexibility. Um, case studies can be very flexible for instruction. We can assign them as homework, um, as group work, in class discussion. They have a lot of flexibility and um, and it also helps kind of break up kind of monotony. Um, we're finding in educational literature that students need to be more active. There need to be some more active learning activities for them. Um, it keeps them from being bored. Uh, it keeps them engaged. Um, and that's what we all need to kind of, I think, start striving for. So there are basically three main types of case studies, and one of the best resources for these are uh, from the University of Buffalo. Um, they have a great, and there's the re that reference is the first reference listed on our talk um, at the end of our presentation. Um, you can search on that site for all kinds of topics um, under subject matter and um, other things. And so they also, I think, break their case studies out to these three types. So discussion, interrupted, and problem-based learning. So in all of these, uh, students are given some pieces of information. Uh, it depends on how much information and what type of information you want to give them. Uh, for the interrupted, you give them small pieces of information at a time. So it's almost like you're putting out breadcrumbs a little bit at a time and then asking them to make conclusions based on those breadcrumbs and then putting all those pieces together at the end. So the students have to figure out how best to use the information they're given and how does that apply to the bigger question at hand. And then these case studies are also great for group learning. Um, you can put them in groups, ask them to research a topic, come back the next day into class and discuss it. Um, and you can put, you know, whatever spin on it you would like, uh, depending on what kind of subject you teach. Um, I know Harvard Business School also uses case studies quite a bit um, because they're they're good learning tools. Um, students get a, a real world situation and they have to kind of figure out, well, how do you solve this? How would I solve this if I was running a business? So these are sort of the three main groups. Um, so at this point, uh, we're just going to stop really quickly and see if anyone has a question about case study in general, and then we'll move on to talk about kind of how we accomplished our goals for the project. Hi, Tasha. I don't see anything in the chat at this point. Um, okay. If people want to raise their hands if they have questions, that would be lovely. Okay. Um, and if you come up with a question later, please just um, put it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll be happy to answer that as we go. Um, our project, uh, 10 case studies were divided between two ALG grants. Um, so we implemented these across three UNG campuses. UNG isn't just one campus. We have, I think, now five campuses. Um, and so the three campuses that the courses, the studies were implemented were um, Dahlonega, Gainesville, and Oconee. And so um, if time permitted, we also made as much assessment as possible. However, uh, COVID took away some of that assessment a little bit, um, prevented some assessment for the spring 19 and fall 2020 semesters. Um, it didn't allow us to assess as much as we originally would have liked to have done. Um, but we're hoping to continue using the studies and, and do more assessment uh, in the future. So our process um, as chemists, we kind of sat down and met and, and decided what kind of topics we wanted to focus our studies on. Um, and we did it based on a couple things. What topics would students really need in their careers? Um, and then what topics did they struggle with? How could we make something like stoichiometry, equilibrium, uh, things like that more applicable to them? 
uh, giving them a different way to learn the material. So we determined we sat down and um, decided our topics. Uh, each person on each grant took two topics to write two case studies. Uh, we did our homework and looking at our references and gathered some more information about what we wanted to teach. Uh, we wrote the chemistry content of the case first because that is the main goal. Uh, we wanted them to learn the chemistry. And then we wrote our narratives afterwards um, so that we could put in the content we wanted them to be able to learn and then put the story behind that. Um, and one of one of the case studies I personally wrote was um, very personal um, and related to a situation my brother has um, in his health. So, you know, and the students, I think, um, also appreciated the fact that we were putting those real world applications in there. So after the cases were written and we went through and edited um, each other's and made sure we didn't have any mistakes or any suggestions for our studies as a group, uh, then we started implementing them uh, in the classroom and making the assessments. So the two grants were divided uh, between several different chemistry courses. The first grant was done with um, our Chem 1152 course, which is typically our survey of general chemistry. Um, most of the students taking that course are nursing students. They're going on to become nurses. And then our 3100 through 4842 were our upper level biochemistry courses. So these topics needed to be topics that apply to either nursing situations, medical situations, um, and other things. So these are the topics that we chose uh, for those studies, and um, students had good feedback for those. And then in our other grant, we focused on our Chem 1151 course, which is our survey course, and Chem 1211 course. And so stoichiometry and equilibrium typically are very difficult subjects for students to understand. Uh, they, they seem to be very ambiguous um, and there are things that you have to apply math to the application. And so we felt like those were two good topics to kind of uh, do a case study with. And then we threw in uh, climate change. That's a, a huge part of our world and news right now. So we related uh, barrier reef decline to the chemistry application of that. Um, I think honestly, the case studies are very good for survey courses. For our Chem 1151, 52 courses, we have students that are non-science majors. And if we can somehow teach them to apply what they are dealing with in the world to chemistry, um, it makes them more educated people better well-rounded people so that when we're getting all this information, even about COVID and other things, climate change, and other things happening in the world, if we can help those students understand why chemistry and science in general is important, um, I think that's good. It gives them a better well-rounded education. And I think those case studies fit very, very well with those courses. So, you know, as with any project, uh, we had some challenges. Um, time also, you know, we all teach full loads um, for courses, so time to kind of fit that into the curriculum because we all feel that pressure to cover 10 chapters worth of material. So fitting them in in the proper way uh, to best aid our students is, is challenging. Uh, time for assessment, we, we got a little bit thrown under for that with um, COVID because we moved online and trying to figure out how do I assess online was a little bit more challenging than actually talking to students in the class and discussing and, and kind of looking at their faces and see what they how they felt about the studies. Um, because we have meetings across three campuses, getting everybody scheduled together uh, sometimes was a little bit difficult. Uh, the grant paperwork, um, this was my first set of grants and I walked in extremely naive um, about that, but I learned a lot. Um, I certainly will move forward easier with that next next time. Um, and so that was a challenge for me personally. 
and then meeting you know original deadlines. We wanted to make sure that we were putting together good studies and quality things to to put out there for to share with other people. So meeting the original deadlines was a, a little bit of a challenge. On the flip side of that, um, I feel like the case studies were very successful. Um, they were easy to implement in the hybrid and online. It kept they kept students engaged. Uh, it was a nice way to do a few different things instead of asking a student just to watch a video and then take a quiz or something else. Um, it was an extra way to learn and encourage and um, remind students why we're learning a certain topic. And students will also sometimes ask, well, why am I learning this? And so I think if we can find a way to put a real world application to this, that helps them make that connection. And I think these studies provide students for deeper learning. Um, up until college, they really some, sometimes yes or no don't have that opportunity. Um, and I think in my courses when I did the case studies, students asked if we could do more of them, um, which is always really refreshing because, you know, 18 year old students, freshmen don't usually ask to do extra things. Um, they're they're asking sometimes to do less. <laughs> so when they were asking, can we do more of these? We really enjoy these. That was very, very encouraging. So um, that made me want to kind of try to fit more in as much as possible. And they, you know, they their discussion with me was that they were learning the material and they appreciated that we were tying it to a real world situation, that it helped them make that connection. Can I make a comment, Tasha? Yeah, sure, sure. So one of the things, and it's anecdotal that I noticed this semester, we moved to this hybrid format and it has been like pulling teeth to get students to turn in homework or assignments. Mm -hmm. But the case studies that I did with them, like the last one, they all turned it in on time without having to be encouraged or emailed or reminded. They seem to be they seem to find this more interesting or interesting enough to actually do it without me having to push them. So um, that was just something I noticed this semester when I was doing it in this new hybrid format. Yeah, and it's a positive, you know, when they're when we're not hunting them down to turn something in, that's that's a blessing. Um, and, and it's encouraging. That means they they've gotten interested in it. I think somebody has a hand up to. Um, Antara Dutta, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, first of all, it is wonderful to know that it is working for your students. Uh, I have a few clarifying questions. Like, is it required for the students to participate in case studies or do you give extra bonus points for doing? Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> um, I require it as part of their grade, so it's it's a required part of the course. Mm -hmm. And students do it uh, like in weekly basis, like how you assess the assessment, like when you are doing pre-COVID situation. How did you assess their like uh, across the campus, different students? I don't think we've really been able to look at compare or do comparison between how it's working on the different campuses yet, but I'll let Tasha Go back yeah, to we, we didn't quite get to that yet. We, we were running out of time. Um, and to answer your, your earlier question, we did. I think all, all of us on our team did count it as some percentage of their final grade um, to encourage them to, to do it. Um, and we gave them to an the assessment. I had conversations with them after they turned the study in, but we also the next slide sort of just um, shows some of the questions that we asked them in the assessment. So we asked them, you know, did you feel like the topic we presented was interested? Did you find it related well to the course content? Um, did it help you to learn the course content? Um, did you find it challenging enough? Because we do, you know, we didn't really want to softball these. We wanted them to be interesting and challenging enough that, that students would get in and kind of, I don't want to say this the wrong way, take the bait, so to speak. Um, you, you want them to buy into this idea yeah. um, and get interested in the topic, but also it needed to be challenging enough that they had to had to dig a little bit. Yes, um, 
and I think it is hard for 11, 1152 might be easier because it is mostly related to the biological system or organic reactions. Mm -hmm. But for fundamental topics like equilibrium or stoichiometry, it is hard to engage them with the real world application problems. Yeah. And especially you mentioned about your personal uh, situation. So I uh, I kind of struggle in that area, like if I want to even start doing st case studies, there is not much to give everybody as a separate topic. You see, like I want to create something uh, that everybody will do on the same subject, but on a different uh, field or different section of that topic. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I don't know if you guys probably do it more <laughs> effectively, but that is my one area I feel like I need to know more. Like if I want to do case studies, what uh, do you give all students the same uh, material to work on or you just uh, separate, let them work in a group or individual? I think you can do it anyway. Um, I, I think we chose to do ours by subject matter. So that when we, I got to stoichiometry in 1211, um, the case study was part of their assignment. And so I told them, I gave them the study and told them, you know, they could work in groups with it if they wanted to. Um, and then they would work on it outside of class for that particular one um, because of the time that we were, were running into. And then the day they turned it in, we discussed it. Okay. So we talked about, um, you know, what answers were missed uh, the most? What question did they have the most difficulty on? Did they find the study was helpful for them to learn the material? Um, just sort of things like that. And then that helped me the next semester that I did the study, um, if we needed to make any edits or I, I think you can do do the studies however is best for your set of students too. Yeah. Um, and if you go to the first reference on our presentation, that link to the University of Buffalo is the night it's free um, and it's very nice and you can search for case studies by subject matter I see. or you know other things and they are there are all sorts of them you can also join their uh, listserv and so they will send you anytime a new study is done and published on their site they will email it to you oh thank you thank um, you so which is is great they've been a great resource and there are some case studies that you can do where every group would have a slightly different topic. Sure. It's not a case yeah, study yeah. that I um, that we wrote, but I used one in my biochemistry course this semester, um, looking at mutations. And so each group of students had um, a different mutation on this gene to look right. at and see yes. what effect it would have. And so there are some of those out there, and it's kind of nice to do those because then you know that they're all doing something different, and then they can share what they did. Um, yeah. It's much more interesting, I think. And is it tied to your lab or is it just for lecture? Um, I do them with lecture. Oh. I did them with lecture too. Uh, but when we moved online in the spring, um, 1152 is a little bit difficult for lab online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I did put a couple of those in for um, in replace for a lab. Um, but Antara, if you want to yeah. if you put your email address in the chat, um, sure. I. I went to a case study conference last fall, and I will be happy to send you um, some links and references from that conference um, to give you some more uh, places to look for case studies. And I think Eric would like, um, Eric Crisp would like the, a link to, and um, probably the Buffalo material. Um, yes, can... that, that link is, let me kind of get to the back of the slide here. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, that reference here, the very first one, um, if you guys turn, put on to that link or go to that, if you Google uh, case studies University of Buffalo, it should come up with their website and you can sign in. It's free. Uh, you can sign in and kind of go and look for what you want to use in your course. This is a nice reference. And so also, um, Jean Mangan was asking about what sort of sources do we get inspiration to develop case studies with? Um, I don't know if I, I get mine, I guess, from my 
personal life, which is weird. So one of the case studies is radioactivity, talking about um, hyperactive thyroids and using radioactive iodine. And so I had a hyper, I had a cat with a hyperactive thyroid. So that whole case study is actually based on my cat. Um, most of them come from, for me, I guess, personal experience or what I'm teaching in other courses. And I, I get some of those also. And I think from the news, um, students one semester, and this wasn't really a case study at the time, but there was the whole debacle with the New England Patriots and the deflate gate with the football. And so we spent some time that day in class doing the math with the gas laws um, and students loved it. They were so that was the most engaged they had been um, because it was something that was right there in the news. Um, we happened to be talking about that same chapter and it and it just fit beautifully. So, and they learned it. You know, they learned uh, so much about all of that, and they were excited and discussing. And um, it, it was great. So I think you know it depends on the the subject that you teach, but also, like Greg said, you can do it from personal experience. You could do it from topics you think students struggle with, and they need a, maybe a different approach learning it um, from the news, from just about anywhere, any inspiration. So any other questions? I think, okay, I think that was most of the questions we've, we've okay. answered. Um, there was actually um, an earlier question. I don't know if you guys had already answered this or not, but um, uh, Eric Crisp asked earlier, uh, any sort of data collection to support how well this worked with the different groups of students? Right, we did take data um, and I did put the data that we, the assessment we were able to get together and that's in our final report for the ALG grants. Um, so there's some Excel graphs and files in there. And overall, um, and I didn't include those in this presentation, I apologize if that was what was needed, but overall students were very positive about these. Um, they enjoyed them. Like I said, they were asking, could we do more of them? Um, they so felt- we really haven't looked at campus to campus. Right, no, we haven't done that. What asking about was the campus to campus. Oh, no, we haven't. We haven't done campus to campus. Um, and that's something, you know, and I think that's on our future slide here <laughs> um, to do more assessment that way. Uh, we do need to look at campus to campus and um, some other things within that data. So we haven't really gotten deep into the data quite yet, but you know, we, we have goals to, to finish some of that. So anything else? I don't see any new questions. Okay, so Clark and Bill, do you have anything you want to kind of add into our? Uh, no, ma'am, I think you, uh, you guys have covered things very, very well. And I'm, I'm biased with these. I, I really, I like them very much. I think they're a great way to pull students in, um, you know, teach maybe not just lecture to them, but let them kind of do a little more active learning and make some application and connections. And um, I I will give Nord Pienta credit also. He was the one who introduced me to these. Um, he was the former director of the Journal of Chemical Education, um, has been in that chem ed field for a long time. And so he introduced me to this topic. Um, and I personally, I've really enjoyed it. It's worked well. Well, and just to just to reiterate, one of the biggest problems that I have seen in all my classes um, is just connecting the dots between the different different topics. I mean, you can have students who you know are great at math, but they don't see how that applies to a chemistry class. And these and these are wonderful for pulling those things together and making them understand how things fit together. Right, and I think for the nursing course, eleven fifty two. Um, students would ask well and not not disrespectfully but ask well why are we learning this and i i had to, it made me sit and think okay well why are we teaching this content you know on the case study is a way for us to say this is why we're teaching it because it applies to this 
um, you know, in several of the studies we wrote, like Greta said, for the radioactivity one, um, for the one that we wrote about solutions, nurses have to understand solution chemistry and um, you know, blood chemistry applications and other things. So it was a way for them to make those tie-ins. So, you know, I, I'm biased. I'm a big fan of the case studies, but I know there are other ways to to do the to achieve these goals, but I think this is a good way. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the pre-nursing students because one of the questions I would get a lot in my uh, my general organic and biochemistry course from the pre-nursing students, they have this exam they have to take and pass and get a good score on to be admitted to a nursing program mm -hmm. and they will often say well this isn't a, this isn't going to be on my exam how is this going to help me get through this exam right and that's what they're focused on you know and these really do help them connect to what we're I, doing I, I think so yeah. i think so um i'm hoping to use as many of them as i can um and there like i said if, if anyone wants extra resources um, if you'll just put your email address in the chat, I can pull some resources from the conference that I attended, and I'll be more than happy to send you all the ones I can find. And, and you know, I, I am open to suggestions too. Uh, you know, goodness, if, if anyone wants to email any of us with, you know, ideas or other things for the studies, um, I, I would am happy, happy, happy to entertain all of that too, because uh, there's always room for improvement. So anything else, Greta, do we have anything else in the chat part? Um, I don't think so, other than um, catching the email addresses, but um, as long as this doesn't go away too fast. <laughs> no, and I, and I will pull, um, I'll pull the chat so that we can uh, get a list of the emails and also just a list of things that people are requesting. Um, and we can work together to put everything in a central place for you. Um, Sure, and I'm happy to share any any information that I have with anyone. Um, more than happy, because I think that's what we should do. I mean, and as teachers, we're navigating kind of unusual territory and how we're having to teach. So I think the more we can share with each other and this ALG program is so nice for that because it's free resource. Um, and so it, it gives us all an opportunity to find other people's use of creative projects and apply them in our own courses and it's wonderful. So I know we got um, a little bit, uh, we went a little bit kind of out of order on the final slide. <laughs> Is there anything you guys missed? I didn't want to. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, like I said, we just did general assessment. Um, we have talked about maybe going a little bit deeper into a SOTL project, possibly. Um, if we you know, could get a little more uh, general assessment under our belt and then maybe do a, a little bit deeper assessment here, too, because that would be helpful. Um, and I think most of us did count those case studies as part of the final grade. Um, student response was positive um, and we maybe hopefully can present some of this at a, a conference somewhere once we get a little more data um, and kind of gauge how well these are working and, and which ones are working best. Um, is there a type uh, of case type that's working best? Um, and maybe that's also another road we could go down. Um, does the interrupted work best than the group discussion or other things? Um, that would be an interesting set of numbers to look at as well.
and, and personally, I'm an analytical local canvas, so you know, I'm, I'm interested in the assessment too. I, I want to see what the numbers look like. Um, that, that's part of my background, so. Okay, so I don't, um, I don't see any other questions here, but if anyone has any, feel free to uh, raise your hand, turn on the mic, um, or put it in the chat. Um, I do want to say I put the links to uh, the case studies in the chat here, um, but you can also find, um, I think only one of them is actually linked on the featured speakers page, but I can put the other set on there as well. Um, uh, so we, we have the chemistry set and then we have the biochemistry set as well. Um, and um, yeah, but if anyone has any other questions, Very interesting. So, and we can put, I could put my email in the chat also. Um, so if anyone, you know, has questions later or wants more information, I'm, I'm glad to, to share. So Tiffany, would you like for me to gather all those emails and, or what's the best way we should do that? Um, I can pull them all for you. Um, I, I, I should be able to pull the whole chat and um, and and kind of compile links and requests for links and emails for you. OK, so yeah. I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat here as well. Okay. And if anyone else in the group wants to do that. We can all share information. Yeah. Um, so it seems like we're wrapping up here. Um, are we OK to go ahead and stop the recording then? I think so. Right. I think unless, unless somebody else has something else. All right, I, um, I'll go ahead and do that then uh, before I do. Thank you everyone for watching the recording if you are. Um, and let us know if you have any questions and stopping the recording now.